In the Kingdom of Arks, the sun has disappeared and left the surface a frozen wasteland. In order to survive, the mortal races have fled underground into vast subterranean cities. But despite their shared hardships, old grudges remain. While in the darkness, a shadowy power plots to destroy what little life remains. Arx Fatalis is a first-person action RPG. When the game begins, you are given the opportunity to customize your character's stats and skills before being unceremoniously thrown into a goblin prison. From there, you start the game with no weapons, armor, equipment, or even memories of who you are or how you got there. As you play, you'll move around and interact with objects from a first-person perspective. You can aim your cursor at items in the environment in order to pick them up and add them to your inventory. Larger objects, such as doors and switches, can be activated in the same way. And once you find weapons and armor, you'll be able to equip them onto your character and enter combat mode. All combat, whether it's using melee weapons like swords or ranged weapons like a bow and arrow, or even magic, happens from first-person perspective. <laughs> Defeating enemies or finding treasure chests will allow you to search them for gear, supplies, and money. You can also find materials scattered throughout the levels themselves. Killing monsters and completing quests rewards you with experience, and when you level up, you'll be able to improve your skills and abilities. As you explore and progress the story, you'll also unlock new areas, which will allow you to delve into deeper, deadlier domains. Yeah. Now, Arx Vitalis is unusual for a number of reasons. At the broadest level, this game is one of those examples that, with other contemporaries of the time, is right on the edge between a traditional RPG where you go through a series of dungeons and challenges according to the specific design of the game, and an open world RPG where you can go almost anywhere and do whatever you want in whatever order you want to do it in. And so, in order to presumably balance that open-world ambition, the developers came up with kind of an inspired idea, where we'll set the entire game underground. That way we can have this huge map with multiple levels, and the player can go almost anywhere they want. But the nature of an underground environment means that the levels are going to be fundamentally enclosed, so you can still control more or less where the player moves, and you don't have to worry about making a skybox. The game also has some uncommon interactivity elements. You can pick up items and add them to your inventory, or take them out of your inventory and leave them on the ground. But beyond that, you can also just pick up and move items around the environment. And the items can actually be influenced by the environment as well. Stones and keys can be moved around to solve puzzles. There's a whole alchemy system where you can take empty bottles that you find and combine them with reagents that you've collected from the environment in order to prepare and brew your own potions. There's even an entire cooking subsystem where you can find ingredients such as water and flour, then combine them to make dough, at which point you take them either in your inventory or just grabbing them off a table, then find a source of heat such as a, a fire or a kitchen stove and actively place them in the environment next to the fire until they bake into bread. But probably the most iconic feature of Arx Vitalis is the magic system. 
Now, when you get into combat and you want to swing your sword or fire your bow and arrow, it's pretty straightforward. You aim your reticle at your target and you click your mouse button to attack or fire an arrow. But when you want to shoot a fireball or cast any other kind of spell, what you have to do is bring up magic mode and then use your mouse cursor to actively draw a series of runes on the screen with each rune representing a magical symbol that when combined with one or two other runes works as the unique identifier for a specific magical spell. And every time you want to cast a spell, you have to input those runic gestures in sequence or the spell doesn't work. So yeah, if you couldn't tell by now, Arx Fatalis is a weird and fascinating game, full of completely unconventional approaches to traditional mechanics. And it creates a situation where it's difficult to define the good and bad elements of the game, because the elements themselves are often a combination of both. Here's a basic example. Melee combat in Arx Fatalis is pretty standard. You equip a weapon, you go into combat mode, and then you click to attack whoever is in front of you. But just clicking only deals minimum damage. If you want to deal full damage, you have to click and hold and wait for your character to finish their windup. It's not a terrible system, but it means that fundamentally, the heavier a weapon you use and the longer its windup time, the more tedious combat becomes. Another example is the story and structure of the game. It starts off rather generic. You are the amnesiac hero who has to escape from the dungeon and save the world. A somewhat common beginning, but that's fine. However, once you get out of the dungeon and are allowed to actually explore, the game starts to become great. The semi-open world nature of the game gives you a lot of freedom. You can run around collecting supplies, fighting monsters, taking on quests, and completing them however you see fit. You can even wander off the primary path and get yourself into trouble. Killing NPCs or sneaking into restricted areas can put you in a position where parts of the game's story quests may break, but it will not prevent you from reaching the end. At the same time, every now and then, the game locks you into a info dump cinematic or a scripted set piece that squeezes dry a lot of the game's open world potential. For instance, towards the end of the game, while investigating a dwarven foundry, you are suddenly attacked in a scripted sequence by a strange black monster that kills you in one hit and cannot be killed itself. This is the only unkillable monster in the game. There's no way for you to know that it's unkillable before you get down here, and the only way to defeat it is by completing a series of platforming segments. A better example of this conflict between open world and linear design uh, is your character progression. As mentioned before, at the start of the game, you're allowed to build your character however you want, either specializing in strength and melee weapons for close quarters fighting, or choosing dexterity and going with more esoteric skills like lockpicking and alchemy. But the game doesn't make it so that all of your choices are equally valuable. There are always going to be enemies that you need to fight, so combat's going to be useful the entire game. Comparatively, there are only so many lock-pickable doors, and the rewards you get for doing so aren't going to give you any outlandish advantages. Another good example is alchemy. You can spend your skill points to learn how to make health and mana and invisibility potions except that higher level potions are only available when you meet certain skill thresholds. And the game doesn't tell you what these thresholds are, so if you want to make the best potions, you have to blindly put points into your material skills in order to hopefully unlock them. But the best example is archery. 
As mentioned before, at the start of the game, you can choose to specialize in ranged attacks. But what the game doesn't tell you is that there are only two ranged weapons in the entire playthrough, and you won't even have access to them until about a quarter of the way through the main campaign. So it's possible to specialize in a skill that has absolutely no use for almost 25% of the game, and that's not really fair to the player. But probably the ultimate example of what I'm referring to is the magic system, which is wild. It's completely iconic, even amongst its contemporaries. As I exemplified earlier, the magic system in Arx Fatalis uh, requires that you bring up magic mode and then use your cursor to draw runes in order, which will activate your different spells. Not only that, but the runes themselves determine what magic you can cast. Once you learn the fire rune, you can start casting fireball spells. Once you learn the lightning rune, you can start casting lightning bolts. And there's a good variety of spells as well. You've got basic attack and defense spells such as magic missile or healing, as well as more utility focused spells such as dark vision, which allows you to see in dim areas, and levitation, which allows you to walk across open air without having to attempt platforming or jumping. When combined with the game's semi-open world, the system works really well. As you explore, you'll unlock new runes, which will slowly add new spells to your arsenal. And this gives you a wonderfully diverse toolbox for solving problems, whether they be puzzles or combat encounters. But just because a system is unique does not mean that it is also useful. And wrangling the magic system in Arx Fatalis can be a challenge unto itself. For starters, what spells you have access to are determined by what runes you've discovered. So if you miss any during your exploration, you could be losing out on entire categories of magic. Also, even though the game includes a little magic spell book that shows you most of the magic spells that you've unlocked and the runes needed to activate them, it doesn't tell you all of the game's spells. But there are also a number of secret spells that you can only find through either experimentation or wiki browsing, and the game doesn't keep track of them in any way, which requires you to either memorize them or write them down yourself. And then there's magic mode itself, which is, uh, is a whole ordeal. I think we can mostly agree that early 2000s character recognition was experimental at best. And the result here is that there's a lot of inconsistency between the runes that I am attempting to draw on screen and what the game is actually recognizing. And the result is that every time you put in the wrong rooms, either accidentally or not, and get a different result, you are consequently going to get either a different spell or no spell at all and have to start all over. And as you can imagine, trying to use this in combat is really tricky. Trying to activate a magic missile while a zombie is about to eat your brains is almost guaranteed to result in some mistakes. Now, thankfully the game does include a queue system where you can preemptively cast and then set up to three spells ahead of time before you activate them using a quick slot. But even this requires you to tediously sit there and draw out the individual spells that you want to add to your buffer when, I gotta be honest, it would have been a lot easier just to press a button and get the exact spell I wanted every time. Arx Fatalis is a game that's difficult to quantify and qualify. You know, and part of that is because so many of its elements are unusual, even amongst its RPG contemporaries. I would give it a 3 out of 4, but only a maybe recommendation. 
I personally enjoyed the game a lot, but I have to admit that most of my satisfaction was of a perverse curiosity of exploring the game world and seeing all the unusual systems that the game developers had included. I mean, this is a game where I can literally mix, roll, and bake bread in real time while exploring a dungeon. This is also a game where I can give my magical sword a speed boost by casting a spell and then rubbing garlic on it, which... What, why would you ever think to do that? Which is the other problem with Arx Fatalis, that as creative as it might be, a lot of its systems are unnecessarily obtuse or actively useless. So yeah, if you want an RPG where experimentation and exploration is a core part of the gameplay, then Arx Fatalis is a shining example of that. But if you're looking for a more traditional RPG with balanced gameplay and character choices, you might be a little frustrated here. Alright, well, thanks for listening. The world above is gone, so I'm down to save the world below. Till next time. All right, just gonna head in and meet the librarian and whoa, whoa, whoa. You, madam, are enchanting. Oh, look at me without my fancy armor on. Perhaps after you're done with work, the two of us could head out in the town and take a night in and oh, what am I saying? Oh, oh, I've been underground for too long. <laughs>